soil scientist. I know maybe half of the folks in the room. Um, why don't you raise your hand if you are an organic farmer? Uh, and okay, one, two, good, great. And if you are an organic farmer, that keep your hand up if you're an organic farmer, if you don't mind. Yep. Okay. Good. Keep it up. Keep it up. How many of you? Put, put your hand down if you do not grow grains. Just to give me an idea. Okay, grains. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Excellent. That's the type of audience I wanted because. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about our long-term organic research that we do at Beltsville, and I'm going to ask for your feedback. So I'm going to show you a little bit of our results, but I'm also, a big chunk of the talk is going to be you guys talking, I hope, and you're giving me feedback on the management that we do. So with that, uh, let me step back a little bit. We're, we're doing organic farming research for in the long term. So we're doing our 21st year of doing the same thing. So why would you do the same thing for 20 years or more? Insane. Well, there's that, but there's other reasons too. <laughs> Everybody meet Victoria uh, Ackroyd, our, our new <laughs> postdoc. Like so <laughs> we didn't plan this, so it's all, you know, like. <laughs> if you want to measure things that change slowly, so if you want to look at soil carbon, or soil health in general, that changes slowly. So you have to do a longer study than a two to five year study, which is kind of the normal for agronomic studies. And if you want to look at how things vary from year to year, you guys know this as, as well as anybody, every year is different. And so getting a sense of how much variability is out there, you can't just do things two years. You might have a good year, a bad year, that gives you a little bit of sense of variability, but you might have two good years, right? So looking at things over the long term is very helpful for a number of reasons. And then the people that develop models need data sets that are long term. So if we want to do some of the nitrogen modeling, was it you, Steve, that commented that you want to look at your nitrogen balances over the long term? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, and release current year from years past. Uh, Based on what idea. you did in the past, in residual type of nitrogen? Yes, yes, yeah. Residual. So what, what model are you, sorry to put you on the spot, but. What model was that? Oh, well, the one I mentioned, I've heard about, it's called ADAPT N. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cornell and a few yep. others. Yeah, yeah. So, so all those types of models like that, these, these decision tools, rely on long-term data sets to really understand how nature that's on our farms works. So that's why we do the same thing every year. <coughs> Might also be that we're crazy, but there is value to, there is a method to our madness, I guess. Hopefully you can all read that. I don't know how, how well that comes out, but what I spend most of my time doing is managing this project called the Farming Systems Project. It was established in 1996. That's three years before I got here, so I can blame other people if it wasn't set up right. But frankly, it's been my baby for 16, 17 years. We have all rotation entry points present every year. So if we have a corn, soybean, wheat rotation, that means we have corn in one plot, soybeans in another, and wheat in the other. And each of those goes through the rotation. So within a three-year rotation like that, we have corn every year. So that you have corn going in all the weather for every year. Because we're scientists, we have to do everything four times for uh, doing statistical analyses. We use full-size equipment. And we're evaluating five cropping systems. We're looking at sustainability. So that means agronomic, economic, environmental. And our systems, we have three organic systems and two conventional systems. And while no-till and organic have both, conventional no-till and organic have both been kind of promoted as more sustainable than conventional till systems, there's really not a lot of data to really show that. There's quite a bit of data comparing conventional no-till and conventional chisel till or conventional till, but there's really not that much long-term organic data. And so this is the only site in the country that includes long-term no-till right next to three different organic systems. <clears throat> and hopefully my voice doesn't go away. <clears throat> These are five systems. The two top ones are conventional systems, so a no-till, we call it chisel till because our primary implement is a chisel plow, and then three organic systems. And you can see here, I'm going to have to walk in front because I don't think I have a pointer. They all have a corn followed by a uh, uh, a rye cover crop followed by full season soybean. And then if you look at just our two conventional after that, we go then to a winter wheat followed by a double crop soybean. So those are pretty, those are the same rotation. Primary difference is in tillage and amount of herbicide use. 
And then we have these three organic systems. Our shortest organic is as short as you can be and still be organic. We have four crops in two years, two of them are cover crops, and we use the famous hairy vetch that people love on this side of the bridge. <coughs> uh, so we have corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn, soybean with, with uh, cover crops in between. Three years, corn, soybean, wheat. And that gives us a window to plant our hairy vetch to grow our nitrogen for our corn. And in our sixth year, we do the same thing, corn, soybean, wheat, but now we're offering, adding alfalfa. So now we're adding a perennial forage into the system. So they're quite different, these three organic systems. Here we, all, here we have only summer annual crops, corn and soybeans. Here we have two summer annuals, one winter annual. Here we have two summer annuals, one winter annual, and one perennial. So those have big implications into, on how well these systems operate. Um, so the goal, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to mimic what farmers do so that what we do then becomes relevant to you in terms of understanding how your systems work and, and, how, uh, and to look at ways where maybe you can improve things. So that's part of my goal here today then is to get feedback from you. I'm gonna show you some of our data, but I'm also gonna ask you, does this make sense? Should we change this, should we change that to look at how these systems operate to, to better match what you guys are doing? So what we do to do, to, um, to, to try to mimic what's going on across the landscape then, before this project was even started, we had a number of uh, meetings. I know Nick Maravel, I think you're a part of that. I don't know if anybody else in this room at the time, this was started in 1993 actually, with the planning of it. And uh, it's quite po who, was, who was an organic farmer in 1993? Okay, a couple of you. Who was, who was? And there was, so there are two people, so the majority of you became organic in the interim, which is pretty interesting. Actually, what was really fun today was to see the panel of farmers who were either the sons or the daughters or the son-in-laws of the people that were on the panel 10 years ago, right? <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, anyway, so back then, before starting the experiment, we, could, we, we asked people what makes sense to do both conventional and organic, and then we also try to do that periodically to make sure that we're staying current. That's what I'm wanting to get from you guys today then, is get some feedback from you. Um, if we look at, just to give you an idea on what we do on conventional, this is our typical management practices for the <coughs> corn, soybean, wheat rotation. So in all cases, we're using either GMOs or treated seed, nothing too special there. Of course, we're using nitrogen fertilizers. We're applying phosphorus, triple superphosphate, and potassium sulfate per soil test. And then we use uh, herbicides as, as needed. Uh, in, in our wheat, we harvest the straw. That's just to give you the conventional in case you have any questions on that. But that's not what we're here for, right? We're here to talk about the organic systems. So again, a reminder of what these systems are, what these systems look like. So then my question is to you, those of you that are organic grain farmers, do these reflect what you're doing? Is there anybody that's using kind of a, a short two-year rotation? <clears throat> and, and, and do you, you guys do this? How how's, how's your rotation differ from this if? Well, the top one, we, we plant very similar and we're using the clover. The, the, the crimson, crimson clover. Crimson clover. And, you, and you, you have some small grains on your farm we though do. too. And so we you use like the next one to three years sometimes. Uh, about 150 acres of that we do each year, but we, but we plant barley instead of wheat. And that was one of my questions that's going to come up here in a second. Just hold that thought for a second. Who else does like a three, something akin to a three-year rotation? Where you get, yeah, Aaron's got some small grains. And so you got, you got a lot of different rotations yeah, going got on. Yeah, we a lot of, I mean, we almost encompass all those different rotations in some form of knowledge. On a given field? Yeah. De depending on all kinds of factors. All kinds of factors. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the more two-year rotation is right next to our dairy. Um, where we can get lots of nutrients from dairy manure, and so we're doing a lot of essentially corn after corn with a small grain winter annual in between that we're, we're harvesting that for forage. Um, and then it's a little bit 
longer. We'll usually include alfalfa in there somewhere. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah. But it's a little stretched out, and we'll usually follow that alfalfa for two straight years of corn before we go back to beans. Are you doing We're your, always harvesting the small grain, winter small grain in between it. It's always for forage? Yeah, at the, at the home farm. Now, as we move away from the home farm out to, to other ground, then we'll start getting into more of a uh, three-year, like you have there with the uh, corns. Yeah, small okay. Small grain cover crop, soybean, wheat. Your small grain, uh, okay, it's whole, uh, okay, good. Anybody else that's using, Aaron, you said like a three-year rotation. Is anybody <laughs> using a longer? Double, double crop after the wheat or barley. <coughs> I mean, it's, that's the difference. There's you double, guys do double, double crop, crop with soybeans in your? Or grain store sometimes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. How, how many folks are doing double crop beans in their organic production? Okay. Oh, interesting, okay. <laughs> And that's, I mean, what we found, there's like a two week difference from where we are in Beltsville to some of where places where you are in terms of planting dates and some of these. So we do have a few differences that way, but that's interesting, yeah. Well, that's, that's Victoria's taking a note on that because one of the things I wonder about is whether in our three year rotation, we have a pretty big gap between our wheat and our veg planting. Our wheat harvest in July and our veg planting in, say, uh, uh, late August or early September. So. Maybe we should be putting something in there, especially if, if that's what you guys are doing. Right. We have like an 8 to 12-year rotation. But in that in the gap between wheat and veg, if you will, we'll go in with, uh, with summer annuals. So we'll plant corn, and cow peas, buckwheat, maybe some sorghum, sedan grass, all in the mix. But we're grazing. So right. that would be my major uh, uh, input here is to get the other side of the street to <laughs> cooperate with you guys and, and, Steve, that's and um, uh, you know look at some integrated systems uh, and stretch your six-year rotation at least eight um, and um, then look at the overall uh, economic and environmental uh, uh, impact for the farm and on the soil health yeah. Because we just get so much more flexibility when we can harvest with four legs or harvest with a combine I mean, or harvest with a baler. There's just different ways to harvest. Uh, and <coughs> in that alfalfa rotation, we'll go in and we'll, we'll, we'll drill right through it with the wheat or barley. We do not, uh, I'm sorry, with barley and rye. We grow a lot of vegetables, but we don't grow wheat. So that's yeah, so you don't you don't worry about it. Yeah. But we plant no-till right into our, our hay fields. And, For, and then you take it off on your first cutting. Take it off on yeah. your first cutting. Or, or we'll get we'll get a fall <coughs> grazing out of it, and we'll get a spring grazing out of it, and then we'll go in and cut uh, cut it. No. So there are all sorts of different things when you've got different ways to harvest and multiple species growing in the same place. So, and we do a lot of it no-till because... Yeah, know. because it's pasture or, or forage, right? And Steve mentioned to me this morning that he said, well, he's thinking about doing some animal stuff. And when I first got to Beltsville, I talked to people about incorporating animals into this. Mm -hmm. You need an, So what you need is you need an animal scientist who's willing to work with you, who's willing to work with a whole animal, not a small cell, <laughs> not a, not a sub-cell. <laughs> so... I mean, there's those challenges, but then the challenges of needing to have someone on the ground 24-7 dealing with your fencing. Yes. And because we have these 30 foot by 363 feet individual plots, we'd have to have that fence, then we'd have to have outside of that a, an, a, an outside perimeter fence that's sturdier in case they get out of their small stuff. Having said all that, we had a scientist come from Georgia who had done that type of thing, and he's saying the same thing to me too now, is we need to get animals on this. So we do have an interest in doing that. The, the, the logistics are complicated. Getting animals doesn't mean putting you in MSP. It's just, you know, there's other places you can put animals. I, I don't know of any other research <laughs> projects at Beltsville. Do you? You, you have some there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying that it, yeah. it would be helpful to those people who are moving towards the grass-based uh, system. <laughs> to let them know how that diversity works in to their overall profitability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Steve, Steve makes a good point too. Any, 
Is anybody who is not, what they do doesn't really get covered by this? Whereas are people, like Evan, what do you, how do you just stuff fit? What do you? We really haven't implemented Brian Fetch into our, our rotations too much yet. We, we'd like to. Um, we've just kind of been doing a little bit of alfalfa sometimes or just a couple crop in the fall. But this is the type of stuff that I, I'd like to yeah, you meant. Yeah, you mentioned this morning. Yeah, that you're kind of looking at the cover yeah. crop program. Yeah, we we just kind of been trying to master just just the corn, soybean right now, and then once we kind of figured it out pretty good, expand upon that with help from others. So. I just have one more question. So, is your double crop beans? Uh, what what's your row spacing on your double crop beans? Thirty. We're going thirty. Did you and thirty? Just twice. Just twice. Right. Yeah. No. Michelle, with the hairy vetch, that's such a hard seed, and it's persistent. And a lot of the resistance you get from farmers is once you got it, it's hard not to die. And so yeah. there's probably less of that used for that reason. Yeah, and so that, that's actually a question that I don't have explicitly on here, but it is something we've thought about is... Um, why not go to something like Crimson Clover? And frankly, b before I got there, Crimson Clover, they had a Crimson Clover and a mix as well. There were people ahead of me. John Teasdale was way ahead on all this stuff. And he was mixing Crimson Clover, uh, annual rye, uh, cer cer cereal rye, and, uh, and peas, peas one year. And he got away from that because he didn't feel like he was getting enough nitrogen out of the system. But that was all at the beginning, so then our nitrogen situation, which I'll show some data, has changed over the years. So I think we actually have plenty of nitrogen in the system because we have similar soils, as I know, where you guys have some of the Mattapeak or Mattapex. I can't remember one of those. And that's a much tighter soil than some of what Bill has, more sandy soil. So we're able to build up some soil reserves that we can really take advantage of and factor in to our nitrogen release. And so. In the, so what you do in your early years, I think, is different than what we do after 20 years. We've built these things up, these systems up, that might be time to start thinking differently. So the reason we did vetch, though, was because we do get more nitrogen out of vetch than we do out of crimson clover. But if we have plenty of nitrogen, maybe we can go back to something like crimson clover and or mix in with the vetch, we can mix in some annual rye. I don't know how many of you were in Stevens talk just now, but he showed some good data showing that you get some good nitrogen release with a li even just a little bit of rye, and you get better weed control and other issues, uh, other things. So, so we're thinking about all those things. So if you have a, if you say, if you tell me that vetch sucks, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we need to listen to you. <laughs> Because you've been telling me for years. <laughs> I've grown veg uh, uh, for over 35 years as in my systems. And I even was at one point, I was a, a veg seed producer. Uh, you know, I would produce veg seed and sell it to other farmers. But if you don't grow wheat, I don't see the downside. If you're growing wheat, now we also have yeah. equipment to separate, but you'll never, unless you really want to do a lot of detail. You'll never separate 100%. You can get 99% of your veg out of, uh, out of something. You'll never get 100% out of it. Unless you want to sit and, there. and we don't have that problem where we are. And, and we have veg growing in ditches and stuff in our area, but we don't have it in these fields. We don't get... It, it, doesn't, it doesn't come back in your wheat? Nope. Maybe one plant in a whole well, field, but that's... In our system, <coughs> we follow it with five years of, of alfalfa and grazing for several years after that. Uh, you know, when you go back into your, when you go, well, by the time you go back into your row crop in your small grain, unless you're putting vetch in your uh, uh, winter cover crop, you, you know, there's, there's no vetch left. You could, you could harvest wheat or barley with no vetch, but you, it's a long rotation. Yeah, well, even in our shorter rotations, I mean, this is the shortest with vetch and with wheat. And we do enough tillage in between there that any vetch that's germinating, I'm pretty sure is getting killed. I don't know if Stephen, you had some thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I mean, this has always been one of those. Uh, it's interesting, yeah. It's always been one of those fly in the ointment. You know, FSP doesn't have hairy vetch issues in the wheat. It, it doesn't at all in the three-year rotation. And you know, why do I think that we've been doing a bunch of 
population ecology, looking at the seed bank and its persistence and whatnot. But generally, what I think is going on is that the hairy vetch is, is more plowed in, right? And and so any seed that so vetch tends to have five percent. So you have about five to eight percent of the seed is hard seed that will persist into the following year and could be a problem. So after one year, you get about five to eight percent of what you seeded out in the field that will stick around. And and then. Uh, so in our case, we plow that down so that we bury that seed, and we work up that ground and have a year of corn production. And then after that corn, we plant um, a rye, and we're not plowing for that rye. And then for the soybeans, we're not plowing, we're just chisel tilling. And so in the case of the chisel till, we're not getting you know, this big inversion. So we bury that seed bank, and it hangs out there. The 5% that survives just kind of hangs out there. And by that following year, it's not really an issue. And so we get to our wheat, we have zero vetch issues. But I mean, I, yeah, well, I know this is just one example. I know vetch is a big concern, so I'm not yeah. trying to sell it at all. But. Yeah, and I've heard it for 35 years, and, and, and it is for some farmers, particularly if they're growing wheat. Yeah. Now, we don't find, we find the hard seeds more like 20%, and we can get, we can get vetch coming up two or three years later. Uh, but we don't mold for it, so we're leaving it more. Yeah, well, that that's another question actually. Is we do mold board, and I kind of wondering if we should be doing that still. Okay, so does anybody have another comment on a rotation that maybe we're not covering here, or a comment? The question about vetch is compared to crimson clover. Is that is it that much better? In terms of nitrogen amounts, I don't know what I haven't looked at the numbers in quite a while now, but easily twenty to thirty percent more nitrogen in vetch. You know, you just have more. You have, you have both more biomass and you have more um, a, a smaller carbon and nitrogen ratio. Well, that might not be that different, right? But you get a lot more biomass in the vetch is really what it comes down to. So you're going more nitrogen. But it breaks down quicker. But it goes, that, that, yeah, well, right. So there you go. So that, and, and I think that's maybe a good reason to get away from vetch. The data that Stephen showed, you know, where you lose it all in a month. Well, the corn isn't taking up that much between. Yes, yeah, so maybe we're wasting our time with vetch. I, I said it, Bill. You didn't, OK? <laughs> Haven't you done some experiment with rolling vetch, planting corn? We actually rolled it here doing from, for, for four years, 1999 to 2002, in that time period. And it worked pretty well some years, and then one year we had a, um, a perennial ryegrass come through the hairy vetch mat that we had, and we didn't know that until it was too late, until we planted the corn, basically, and then we had all that stuff coming up, and it was a disaster. And that, well, that's when John Teasdale was more in charge of this, and he said, ah, we're not doing this, it's too experimental, but since then, Stephen has done a lot more work on those types of systems, and. I won't get into that now because I do want to keep going on this. And he did give a talk. Did you by any chance get a chance to see his talk? Just in the last session? Yeah. Yeah, so I'd, I'd suggest you talk to him more on that no-till stuff. That is a thought. You know, we could go that way. Uh, for the corn systems, generally, Stevens told me, it, this, it, it's, it's really not ready for prime time. The soybeans, the rye before the soybeans is more effective at this point. So there's, there's things to tweak. And again, we, we're trying to mimic what you guys are doing. So if you guys aren't doing that, we don't want to do that. And I'm assuming nobody's doing no-till organic corn. Is that fair enough? Raise your hand if I'm wrong. Damn. <laughs> and would you, are you doing it again this year? No, but we're going to try it again. Yeah, OK. OK, so it's experimental, though, still. Yes. Is, OK, and that's basically what I'm looking. Um, Okay, next question. Wheat versus barley. We're, we harvest wheat second, uh, first week of July where we're at. You guys probably harvest wheat before that and barley even earlier than that, right? So that has a big impact on all this stuff. We're selling, you know, for the economic analysis we do, we sell our wheat grain. So we're not going it for silage or, or any of that. Why do you guys use barley instead? Who, who does wheat? We, we've done some wheat. I mean, barley is really it's a risk mitigation. The opportunity if you grow wheat, if it gets rejected for vomitoxin, all of a sudden your value plummets. Um, whereas barley, you, you've got just a more stable market, and you're getting it off earlier. You're getting double crop beans in. 
And that's all on the organic market, right? Yeah. For the barley, yeah. I mean, but it's just the opportunity to get it rejected. Hmm. The bomb toxins risk. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Any other comments on that? Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're all in barley because it comes off earlier, so it allows us to control summer weeds and get a second crop in that we use for grazing or whatever, but also because we're growing veg. And it's not an issue uh, if you've got uh, uh, you know, veg seed in there. Barley. We're consuming all of our own grains. So yeah, it's that's really not an yeah. Issue. And we're doing that's a, I mean we're doing cash crop operation really here in terms of what we're trying to mimic. And so there's that added piece that, that does make a difference. Issue in, or I can tell where your plots were years ago. <laughs> yes, veg. I know exactly. I have to go around them. The barley's it's just veg and barley. It's Ruined, yeah. I mean, not, oh, not, thanks. Not on you. <laughs> you're welcome. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> that's, that's on, on my sandy soil, I think the veg gets going early and yes. and times with the barley. By the so you, <laughs> uh, let's talk more about that after. I'm kind of curious anyway, about that. Yeah. Um, so does so a couple of people do some wheat, but is barley more popular? Is what I'm kind of getting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is management the same for barley and wheat? Pretty much from, Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I didn't do cash crop, but I always use barley versus rye with my veg because rye can get away from you. Yeah, on that's right. That's right. I have winter, right. I have rye. I'm six one up to my nose. Yeah. And it was wet. Yeah, right. And, you, and it's, and it was five five the day before. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point on the, we do keep a close eye on our rye cover crops. Uh, we kind of discussed this already, hairy vetch versus other legumes. Is anybody doing a legume, anybody putting some grass, some kind of grass in their legume cover crops? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the the time. Cover crop program, you mix a little barley with the... Oh, that's right. Like, yeah, yeah. Slow yeah. That's right, you guys do that, yeah. Others, others do that too? Or, or, yeah, you yeah, both, I mean, yeah. We, we never plant pure. Like, yeah. No. I'm behind the time. I'm behind the time. Well, that's why I'm here. Well, you know, we didn't have a conference last year, so. <laughs> uh, I guess we kind of discussed that already. Okay, good. Great. This is excellent feedback. I appreciate that. Here's our uh, crop plant uh, plant and seeding rates. Do these make, does anybody see something here that doesn't make any sense to them? Well, I mean, we do a little higher on both corn and beans. We do like 31,000 on the corn. 225, 250 on soybeans, and uh, primarily for wheat control. For wheat, yeah, right. But uh, mm -hmm. I must say, we're in 36 inch. Yeah, right. we're 30 inch, yeah. Right. And that allows us also to get cover crop on a little bit easier into the standing. Uh, and you can use horses. <laughs> no, 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 you need 40 inches. Oh, you need 40? Yeah. See, I, you know, you got to get with this. I'm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, horses, I need to uh, anybody, anybody else have any thoughts on this? Is maybe a little low, or is it where you guys are at? We'll run 30 to 32 on a lot of it. Uh, soybeans, uh, early se cool season beans, it might be a fresh 100, 180, 190. And then be to 200 to 220 on short season. On so double crop? Yeah, on double crop trying to get a canopy. How about you guys that do double crop? Do you guys do Ohio? No, we're right around 200. Also, so it's about. And that's going to, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now, what time we got? What time do we go till? Until 3 and you have until 3.15. 3.15, okay. Well, I'll just keep going and we'll get as far as we get. Um, this is kind of our typical management for our organic systems. And I put the two, I got the two year, the three year, and the six year in different columns. And if, if it says the same thing on, if the, if, the, if the text crosses all three boxes, that basically says we do the same thing on all our different systems. So really the only thing we do differently is how we manage our nitrogen on these three different systems in that we, do our hairy vetch in our two short-term systems. And then we, we, we adjust the amount of poultry litter we put on based on how good a stand we got on our hairy vetch. And in our two-year rotation, we're planting the hairy vetch after soybean harvest, so that's October usually. And sometimes it just doesn't take, you know. So I, or what 
Poultry litter then would, we would tend to up it. So these are kind of average, average rates. So we tend to get higher rates of poultry litter on this short system. And here we might go down to one ton if we get a really good vetch crop. Do you have a nutrient management plan by state of We do have a, we started doing a nutrient management plan by state of Maryland. Or you don't need one? Well, I don't know what the rules are, but we want to do what you guys are having to do. So, so I have a, a part-time technician who gets to learn all that stuff. And that comes, that'll come up in a little bit. Above the law. We're above the law, yeah. We're the feds. Um, and then sometimes in our alfalfa system, we don't put any poultry litter because we actually do a count on our, our alfalfa stand density. And Maryland tells us we don't need more nitrogen, that we have enough, enough nitrogen. So we actually add less poultry litter over there. Um, all the phosphorus we get from our poultry litter. We actually use potassium sulfate. Do you guys, people use potassium sulfate that you're allowed to use in organic systems? We have low potassium soils. Does anybody have that issue? Yeah, well, remember, we did work on that. We used potassium right. on two fields. That green sand. Well, no, we put oh. potassium sulfate on one and we put green sand on two fields. We had a small response rate according to your data. <laughs> And uh, uh, the more we graze, the less we need to add potassium. Right, right, because you're cycling it all back in. Where we're, we're doing alfalfa, we're going with potassium and alfalfa. Yeah, you'd have to, I think. And that's part of what our needs are greatest, of course, in our six year rotation. Yeah, yeah, because alfalfa just sucks it up. Um, so, here, so our weed management, primary tillage is moldboard plow during the corn phase, as uh, Stephen mentioned. Chisel till doing the soybean. This is just corn. Let's focus on corn. <laughs> Primary tillage, moldboard plow, and then we rotary hoe on the day of planting to break up the crust right above the, the row, and then as often as we can when it doesn't rain, right? Does everybody use a rotary hoe here, or do people do use tine weeders or other kinds of one rotary hoe? Going, going? Well, we use both. You both. Depending on soil conditions. Both. Depending on soil conditions. And residue conditions. If you have too much residue, you're just going to collect a lot. We like to leave a lot of residue on the surface. We're not getting any residue on the surface with our moldboard plow, of right, course. Right, right. Right, right. Yeah. Which is actually a question I want to raise. And you guys do both also? Yeah, we do. We do rotary hill and tine weeder. Yeah. And then we do have a tine weeder, right, Stephen? Yes. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Okay, so we ha we're using a... Uh, Actually, why don't, we, why don't we ask a question about that? Yeah, so I, know I, that, I thought you knew the answer. I know that yeah. folks are, are doing time weeding or rotary hoeing is that, at, at, based on what their soils or what the conditions are, whether you've got cr uh, crusting or not. But crop are, residue. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is anybody doing them in, in tandem? Or combining them? Well, you're pulling them both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I've been wondering this for a while now. That it just seems like we know that we have a lot of conditions where the rotary hoe doesn't do anything, and, and or we have a lot of conditions where the time meter doesn't do anything. And it makes sense to me that in tandem, they might complement each other. That you know, the, you could crack a crust with a rotary hoe, but you can shatter that with a time meter. And that maybe combining that technology might be useful for organic producers. I think we want to have a rotary hoe just over the row and then have time to eat them mm. between because I think they can whip, take more weeds out than the rotary hoe, especially in the tracks. Yeah, yeah. the tracks. It's usually the tracks, tracks, yeah, where the tracks were yeah. between the rows. Doesn't okay. ever touch it anyway. Mm -hmm. You can work on that this afternoon, Steve. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, a, he's an ag engineer even though he said he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. Uh, we're doing 102 day corn. So that's whatever. I mean, how 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 long a corn do you guys do? And we're, again, we we're a little different than you guys. Go around the room real quick. We're a little bit longer than that. Yeah. We're 108. Yeah. Days so not. And for this, for grain corn as opposed to silage. Yeah, for, for grain corn, we'll we'll run anywhere from uh, 108 to 114. Yeah. Um, you know, if we get into silage corn, uh, we got some down as low as 93, but that was going behind barley this year. Oh, yeah, so you double cock on them, essentially. You know, and optimum would be like 110 or so, but I, sometimes I do have to do a split harvest for drying purposes, so I can dry part of the crop. Oh, yeah, right, so I do, right. I do like a 95, 98, and then split it with a 108, 110. Yeah, so it's those factors. 
about to say, uh, yeah. Okay, and we kind of talked about this already. So, so you notice like these getting bold, some of these things, that's what I'm looking to talk about. Well, have you guys talked to me about? Uh, so the hairy vetch, yeah, we talked about that. Here's uh, a little bit of data to break things up a little bit. Um, some of you know, remember John Sporgo, one year he had an experiment out at FSP where he put a microplots out there where he added no nitrogen that year. So in his conventional systems, we added no nitrogen fertilizer. In the organic systems, we had no cover crops and we added no poultry litter. And we just grew the corn and we saw what kind of yield we got. And uh, 10 megagrams per hectare here is about 160 bushels per acre. So you can basically see that what we've done is we've built up our, our reserves, our soil nitrogen reserves, where we're getting going 150 to 160 bushel corn with no new corn, no new nitrogen, right? So this is without the vetch, without the poultry. It's like, wow, that soil, this is this organic matter, this organic farming does work. This is what you're trying to do in organic farming, right? You're trying to build up the organic reserves. Of course, we're doing hand weeding in these microplots because we want to see just the effect of nitrogen. And your dad, Matt, would tell me, yeah, but you need a lot more nitrogen to take care, because the weeds are going to take up a lot of nitrogen. So there is some value. So that, that, that is an important point. But the point is, we're still getting, with no nitrogen additions, some pretty darn good corn yields, right? No irrigation either. Your no, that's not true. That year, we did do irrigation on that plot. What's your organic matter percent on that soil? So our organic matter percent is about 3%. Yeah, it's higher than what you would be able to get. That's right, or, or in your sandy soils as well. And so, so that's an important piece of it. And you guys probably have similar. Yeah, we're a little lower than that. Yeah. You know, better than a lot of these two, one, two, three. Yeah, we're maybe two, eight, two, nine. I mean, what? Uh, yeah. But, but Michelle, I mean, we're also seeing very similar results on the Eastern Shore. Uh, that, and that's where I had the OF, and I, I don't have it in, so thank you. That's perfect. Right. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, yeah. I tried to get to that. Yeah. I ran out of time because I talked too much, and, and so uh, I, I missed a couple of slides at the end. I'm running out of time because they're talking too much. Well, we have that evidence. <laughs> I mean, even on the Eastern Shore, just the history of manure and cover crops after five or six years, a history of doing that. I mean, incredible yields without any other source of fertility. So you can really build up those base mineralization potential and have good buffer. I, I want to be very clear when I say this, though, because there are folks traveling around the country and preaching stop fertilizing, and that you can do it all with cover crops. Or, and, and I'm not suggesting that at all. This just means that you've built up that buffer of years of, of, of management, but you can mine that and lose that value if you just start you know, mining it. So it, it's not, it, the idea is that we can back off in organic systems on manure quite a bit. Once you get into a more mature organic <coughs> system, you could be dropping those manure rates considerably. I know when you have a dairy that's not, that not, not looking to reduce it. <laughs> you got to put it somewhere, but anyway. Yeah, right, right. And that's, and that's what we found on, um, we did some research on the Mason, the Fry, and the Cooper forms, and basically found that poultry litter applied at a phosphorus replacement rate gave you the same crop yield <coughs> if you had a legume cover, legume cover crop plus phosphorus application of manure gave you the same yield as a legume cover crop plus a nitrogen application of, of manure. I didn't quite state that right. Do you guys get what I'm saying? So in other words, you can pull back on your manure and not get a yield. Yeah. If, if you, and you have to factor this in, so then, but that was even on you guys as more sandy soils, you know, and you guys have irrigation where you're really getting some pretty high yield. Yeah, just a counterpoint to what Steve said, in our, on our Montgomery uh, County location, we had no livestock, and uh, we went and uh, without any fertilization except uh, phosphate once in mine. Uh, and we grew our corn there, and you guys have seen it, and uh, we were able to do it in a five-year rotation without adding fertilizer. That was primarily sweet corn. So it's a different, it's a different yeah, it's thing. A little lower, yeah. So it's a, it's a different dynamic. But I'm just saying, there is something to be said for building up the reserves in the soil. Thirty years, but yeah, right. To be said but then you do have to factor that in, right? Because then I don't think the nutrient management plans take this into account completely. But no, you no, do get a benefit that you need to account for for your own, you know, 
so benefit. What is the parameter for that? What was the parameter you're using? The oh, to percentage of to measure that. Yeah. It, the, these guys are talking about percentage organic matter. You know, when you send in your samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's three percent. It the, the depends. It is, but the, the problem with organic matter, it's very difficult. You, you have to be very careful, is that there's different fractions of organic matter. Uh, and, yes, and so, you know, and, and since there's all these different fractions of organic matter, some of it is very readily available and some of it's yeah, not. Right. So you could see no difference in your organic matter content between two fields and right. have huge differences difference of nitrogen availability. And how do you measure, can you measure that? Is that quantifiable? That, that's yes. why there's, it's, Yes and no. Well, <laughs> this is why there's no nitrogen. There's really no nitrogen availability. When you send your soil sample to get tested, they don't give you a nitrogen number because it's so dynamic. So that's the no part of the answer. The yes part of the answer is if you go out and take a pre side dress nitrate test, you know, <laughs> when the corn is about a foot tall. And you measure nitrate. What is it in Maryland? Is it down to two feet or is it one foot? Does anybody do this? I don't can't remember. I'm blanking out. Is it eight, eight inches? Yeah. Is it eight inches yeah. for the PF for the PSNT? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's eight inches. I think. Twelve inches. Twelve inches. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say for PSNT, <laughs> twelve inches. <laughs> and and think this is extension great or what? <laughs> <laughs> so at, at, at twelve inches, and then if you're over a certain amount. The, the recommendation is to not add any more nitrogen. Yeah. And if you're lower, the recommendation is to add some nitrogen, but they don't tell you how much to add. And so this is, this is largely, but this is essentially. And, and the reason that they don't give you that is because there's too much variability. That they've done the research to show, and uh, that was a joint work between University of Maryland folks and Jack Meisinger at ALS. And they did it all over the state. And it's largely useful for soils that have received manure over the years. Yeah. And so it's kind of a threshold approach rather than the more uh, And things work better if you're, in, in your, if you're in irrigated systems, right? If you're not in an irrigated system, then you, know, you, you don't know if it's water or nitrogen, so all bets are off. But if, Which if you're is a good segue. You, know, you can know that it's not water so that you can plan. Right, thank you. So, so that, so the reason I was talking about all this, my, th my thinking based on all this is we're probably still adding too much nitrogen. And your point about the hairy vetch decomposing very fast is maybe we shouldn't even, maybe we should go to uh, slower release nitrogen uh, cover crop. Um, oh, so that, so that's kind of also a prelude to say maybe we're also adding too much poultry litter. So we're actually doing a study to reduce our poultry litter to see if we can get away with that on this site. Uh, so moldboard plows. Who does not use a moldboard plow? Let's do it that way. Okay, sweet. So, okay, good. We use it sometimes. What do you do it based on what? Based how, on how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> we, we try to get away from it the last couple of years. We have a ripper and we've been disking the ground and pulling a ripper through it instead of moldboard plowing. Was it a ripper? Is that like the subsoil or is that something like different? Subsoil. Because, yeah, that, I think we're, yeah. They're just a break from action. Well, it's for compaction, but we're, 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 we just think that the plow, we, we, the first few years, we were plowing everything every year. And we sort of thought that, you know, through the cover crops, maybe we were building our organic matter up a year, a little bit during the winter, but in the spring, we got the plow out in the disc and we just worked the ground to death. So we, According to my son-in-law here, we should stop plowing so much. So we we haven't plowed much the last couple of years. We had to chisel plow to rip it. Yeah. I'd say there's a place for it. There's still a place for a plow and even all these other conventional tillage tools. I just think maybe less of it. Um, we'd like to look into some new new items, new tools yeah. to try out. Yeah, which was one of your main points this morning, right? And I think we probably need it in the alfalfa. Or Well, you've got alfalfa, but you're not using a, a moldboard plow. No, some feedback here. I mean, I'm looking to save 20 to 30 percent of the alfalfa stand for planting my corn straight into that. Oh, that's right. You told me that once. Right. The, the real issue is because we, we don't grow pure alfalfa and never would, we, the, the issue is how to not back the grass. But uh, if we do our disking right, we're, we're already leaving 5 to 10 percent of the alfalfa, and that's just fine by me when my 
We're disking. Who does use a moldboard plow on a regular basis other than me? <laughs> OK, yeah. And you're finding it necessary for Mina? That's just, I mean, that's just been our, our thought is to just, um, just turn it over each year just to kind of get rid of that weed bank and restart it up. So, I mean, like I said, uh, it's, it's a fault in, in the back of my head to try new things, but we haven't had the opportunity yet to try them. So this is we haven't either, know. obviously, after 20 years. So that's, that's why I'm... This think is yeah. working best for us yeah. right now. But, we, you know, we do pretty intensive uh, time weeding and rotary home and cultivating. So. Yeah, afterwards, right. Yeah, and we do too, right. Anybody else? Somebody else had their hand up that uses yeah, a mulch? We find, for us, I mean, the big difference is where we're doing double crop with a small grain for forage harvest, we're trying to get that top as clean as we can get it because we're going to go in there, we're going to mow it, we're going to merge it, and we're going to chop it. And we're not looking for that extra fodder, dead material in there from a feed quality standpoint. And then the other thing that we'll typically find is we feel like we get a little bit less um, damage to the to that corn when it's coming up with the rotary hoe if we get it turned down because there's I mean, if you get trash on your rotary hoe it yeah it builds up it, yeah. it builds up and it can do some damage yeah. uh, now as we get get away from the home farm where we're double cropping everything um, then we'll start to do more chisel plow more deep till with the ripper um, and get away from that we're, we're having that mass biomass on the top is not quite as critical we'll get away from that whole board plow how deep does the ripper go? Uh, Do you know? We can go down, depending on soil type, 14 to 14, 16 inches. Really, yeah. yeah. Well, OK, good. Well, maybe we need to get rid of that. OK, and rotary, that's, this, we already discussed that. That was more the rotary hoe versus the uh, tine weeder. Anything else on corn? This is it for corn. I'm going to move on to soybeans. and there's. Fewer issues there, we'll zoom through that. <coughs> okay, soybeans. So we got we're doing a three point four Blue River soybean, is that about what where you guys are at? And then one we're planting wheat after this and wheat or vetch after this, so there's some value to going shorter. One year we went even shorter at two point eight, I think. And we didn't even get a on a thirty inch row, we didn't even get a canopy. And so we actually got weeds in between the row, which we usually don't. And that was kind of a disaster. So we, we kind of learned the hard way that we need to. And the reason we went with a shorter bean was to try to get it off quicker so we could get the, uh, the fall planted crop in. So it's kind of a balance between too short or too long. So this makes sense to people, though, this type of. If you're latitude, it's, I mean, it's going to change. I, I know, right. Miles, I know, yeah. You've got to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, same question with the rotary hose. So you guys use the rotary hose and or tine weeder on it, on both corn soybeans, right? There's no distinction between. Um, okay, we're into wheat already. So this is what we do. Uh, we actually don't use an organic wheat variety. Those of you that do wheat, do you use an organic wheat variety? We actually uh, use the same variety that we use in our conventional systems, but we order it without, with no seed treatment. And it's organic if you save it. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We didn't. Save it. Yeah. Not supposed to. We're patenting some of Yeah, yeah. But if we go to Bali, I guess that. Anyway, uh, so this is actually where the nutrient management becomes difficult, and we quite, ha haven't quite figured it out because what we what we started doing a few year uh, maybe the year after I got there was instead of well, let me back up when the project started. They started by applying the poultry litter on the wheat at green up, the same way you would like a, f a nitrogen fertilizer on a conventional system. And then uh, Ken Staver from University of Maryland said, yeah, you can't do that. You should really plow it in in the fall, keep it hidden from, <coughs> keep it from running off. And so we started incorporating two tons in the fall. And our wheat yields were pretty much the same in our conventional and our organic. In the conventional, we were managing our nitrogen more tightly. So that seemed to be working pretty well. Incorporate it in the fall. It's not going to run off. But it could possibly leach any of the nitrogen. You're hiding your phosphorus so it's not running off with any of the rain. 
and our wheat was pretty good. Well, the newest nutrient management comes out and says, well, you can't, you can't apply that much nitrogen in the fall on your wheat. So now like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> and so that's where we're at now. And this is what we're doing. And we're kind of cutting the edges close in that we look at our phosphor test phosphorus and uh, we can add about one ton at planting. It's actually asked for like 0.8 tons. Well, we got a pretty nice applicator that maybe we could get that, but <coughs> you guys might not be able to do that. So how do you, what do you guys do <laughs> with your, your small grains in terms of fertilizing them? Or is there we're, something? No, we're fairly similar. We're going in, uh, most of ours is a top dress, but we're going in right now actually and trying to get in on that barley and that wheat. Um, but actually, I've got some pictures on my phone of what that barley looks like, and you can tell it's just starved for nitrogen. And where the pile is, I mean, there is about a two-foot to three-foot band around that pile where it's just as green. Dark green. Dark green <laughs> and on the downwind side for about 15 feet. Oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> free delivery. Um, so you put nothing in on the fall? Uh, Boy. It, it really depends, but we'll, we'll try if, if our plan will let us um, yeah. go back in. But now, if we're coming behind corn with it, you now we're trying to get as much on that corn crop as, as we can. Yeah, so you have some, yeah. Well, we're coming after soybeans, and you know, you're supposed to get some benefit with soybeans, but right. iffy. We were worried about putting two tons on at green up now because of the reasons that you mentioned. One is that you're, you're going to be starving to begin with, and then if you're putting two tons on, it may be putting on too much in terms of the phosphorus potentially moving off. And some of, some of it would depend on, on what your follow crop is. So like where we're going in with beans, it was about a ton and a half is what the plan was calling for. Um, and other places um, where, I mean, we're really having to skimp it and go with a ton if it's going to be followed by corn because it might not be going for grain harvest but forage right. harvest. And so you've got to go in and really skimp it on that barley so you've got enough left over for corn. So yeah, um, now the, with the dairy manure, you know, we can go in uh, and top dress it. I'd say probably going around six to seven thousand gallons an acre. Um, most of that's all triticale. We can go in at that and then come right back in at corn at another, you know, eight thousand gallons. Yeah, and you guys are dealing with liquid. Yeah. 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 All right. So you got to I mean, balance it over. Nutrient profile. Right. 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 So you have <laughs> MDA wanted to, well, I was allowed to put two tons on, they wanted me to split it on barley or wheat. Split between it, fall and spring or two in the spring? in March. Two in, yeah, right. It doesn't, you really need right. to get it all on as early as you can in March, so it has time to mineralize. So you go back and put some on in April, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, it's too late. Too yeah. late. So I don't yeah. know why, where they come up with that, but that's what they want. Track, track it all up. Yeah, now you're, you got, yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah, tough. Okay. Participate in the cover crop program, program, of course, for barley for us, we can't put anything on oh, in the fall. Of course, that leaves us with spring. It leaves either you can use poultry or a willer just carrying product that's organic that they can top dress with. So are you guys doing that? Or? We started we've tried, we've started trying it. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we think maybe we'll get a better response from the poultry or at least maybe more consistent yeah. response. Um, uh, but maybe poultry or might be because it kind of seems like it's the poultry or I don't, you know, heat dependent, weather dependent. That's right. And, and, and if it's just sitting on the surface there, I'm just seeing the volatilization, you know, right. and all, all kinds of, yeah, right. right. Okay, so we're all dealing with the same issue. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. What's that? <laughs> the state gets to it. He's slow on that. Even the feds have to deal with the state, right? Oh, uh, well, you're down to about five minutes unless all these folks want to stay. Ah, uh, there you go. Well... Let me see if we can, uh, so okay, that was, that was that issue I wanted to ask you about. Oh, and then, so this is really actually maybe one of the last questions I want to get at anyway. Interesting that you guys are planting double crop cash crops that you're selling, right? Which is an option for us too, but we do have this big gap, gap in our three and six year rotations where we harvest our wheat first week of July and we're planting our legume end of August, beginning of September. So that's a, and we've, you know, 
we wait for the weeds to come and we kill them and it's like, oh, this is this is beautiful naked soil. We're not supposed to have that, right? This is not what we should be doing. So what do you guys suggest we do? Do we, uh, this one seems clear. Does anybody do leave the soil naked in the summer that long in any of your rotations at any point? Or is this something we should definitely get away from? Get away from. Get away from. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what we're doing. We've done it for quite a, quite a few years, not every year, but we're uh, on our barley, and we've done it on rye. We are uh, putting liquid organic fertilizer on, and we're putting red clover in with that first of March. And then when we take the small grain off, we have clover already established, and we'll let that grow during the summer, then around Labor Day we'll mow it. And then we, in the spring, we got 150 acres like that this year. We have a nice clover crop there right now for corn. So you mow it and harvest it off, or mow it and no, just no, leave it there? Let it, let it continue to grow through the fall, establish better, and then the spring comes on strong. And so it gives us a longer cover. Yeah, crop right. Established and hopefully produce more nitrogen. So that's red clover, that's right? Red that's clover. the point. Yeah, yeah. You say you just put it on the high board? Uh, Willard just put it on the right leg. They said they've done it with alfalfa. Yeah. So what is working really well for us is we just started trying this. I haven't done a comparison with these other approaches, but we've been drilling it in. So we'll come in when there's snow on the ground, or we'll just come in sometime in February, March, and we'll drill that red clover like into, the, into the wheat. Instead of spinning it on and just letting freeze thaw right. work it in, yeah. we'll just drill it to get a really uniform catch, and it's yeah. doing really well. It's doing really well. And then we. we yeah. yeah, say if your soil conditions are right. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right, if the ground's frozen, all you're doing is just cutting, you're just making oh, no, it. No, yeah, that's right. No, yeah, yeah. But if it's saturated, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you got to get in before it gets all squishy, I guess. Yeah, but so we just so, go in, that's what I'm saying, the ground yeah. is frozen and hard, and you're just scratching it in. You know, well, that's what's nice about lighting. It's a hard seed, too. You know, you got to wait until exactly. the conditions are right. It's not just going to rot or disappear. And we've even played around more, more, more recently now, coming in and trying to simulate grazing, right? So, because we, we don't have animals, as Michelle mentioned. So, uh, we'll, <laughs> uh, we, we would uh, simulate grazing in the fall. So the red clover takes in the spring, it just hangs out there underneath the wheat. And then in the, in the fall, we'll simulate grazing and then drill cereal rye into that red clover. And then we'll get this beautiful rye, red clover. So we get the grass legume that we're trying to get, but we get the benefit of the red clover being there year round. That's been, I mean, we're only yeah. in early stages. How are you simulating your grazing? You're like chopping it off. Chop. Yeah. I'd love to just have a party out there. Look at how we're going to have a field day. Go yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. oh, and chop it over the wasp. Graduate students. The idea is that you just want to get some of that competition for light mm -hmm. gone. So yeah, because uh, so my experience with that type of system, which is part of the reason we don't do it here, is was in Michigan, where um, we would only get a good red clover stand if the wheat stand wasn't very good you know so if you had a good wheat wheat yield you pretty much shadowed that stuff out get out of here so but my primary anyway okay that's obviously a sign that we need to call this a, call this the end this has been very helpful for me guys i apologize if it wasn't that helpful for you but uh it was your party there's my party there you go and uh you supplied the food and That's you didn't have to did. and you didn't have to listen to me talk all the time which is always a pleasure for me actually so uh thanks so much and uh i think that's i don't know jenny if we meet is that it